Hello and welcome to another episode of Bevy Basics. In this video, I'll be covering Bevy's asset feature. I'll start with what exactly assets are and what Bevy calls assets and how they differ from other types in Bevy. This will cover the asset struct and the handles struct that Bevy provides in its preload. I will then cover how to create an asset using code or load one asynchronously from a file using the asset server. I will then show you how you can access this data once it has been loaded into your application. Then I'll cover how to, you can create custom assets for your own game application in use. And finally, I'll be covering asset events, when and why they fire. In a future video, I'll also cover in more detail the asset server and how to go about creating custom asset loaders so that you can load your own assets through the asset server. So what are assets exactly? Well, in game development, some data types are unique to each entity that holds it, such as its position. In Bevy, this is accomplished using components. But sometimes we need data that is not associated with a specific entity, but instead to a game state or the world as a whole, such as the time between frames or say the size of a map. Bevy has is covered here as well with resources, but there's also a third case. Sometimes we need data that is unique to some but not all entities, but is large and bulky and shared between a quantity of entities. And so we don't want to have components that are unique when they're not actually representing unique data. Or we have a piece of data that may be changed and we want to affect all related entities, such as meshes and animations. This is where we need assets. Since Bevy uses assets to represent large or shared information that is not necessarily unique between entities, Bevy must combine both its resources and its components in order to achieve this goal. Bevy does this by having an assets resource that is then pointed to by a handle component. The assets resource is a struct that takes in one generic argument representing the asset that it contains and works like a hash map using the asset handle as a key. Whenever you load or create an asset, you will need to provide a handle ID or you will be provided with one depending on which function you use to create it. Handles are the counterpart to this and represent the keys in a hash map. They represent uniquely loaded assets of their generic type. Handles can be added to entities as components to represent the link between them and their associated asset or stored into other resources in order to be used by other systems to link data together. A handle contains a handle ID and a handle type. There are two variations of ID. The first is a generic ID, which contains the UUID of the asset and a U64, which distinguishes this asset from all other loaded assets. The UUID is consistent across launches of your game and needs to be provided for each individual asset type whereas the U64 is uniquely generated at runtime. This can be done with a random number generator or using other algorithms, such as hashing the name of the asset. There's also the asset path variant of ID, which is similar to the normal ID, but uses the assets path and an optional label as unique identifier. The path and label are both hacked into U64s and stored as the ID. This increases the speed at which comparisons can be made, but does mean that an asset's path ID is not reversible, so you need to store the path somewhere else if you would like to look it up. This tends to be done inside the asset server, which keeps a dictionary of all currently loaded paths. The handle also has a handle type associated with it. This differs from the generic type that tells you what type this handle points to, and instead represents how strong the link between the handle and the asset is. Strong handles are reference counted and will prevent assets from unloading as long as at least one strong handle exists, whereas weak handles are more of just references for the sake of being able to traverse paths. They will not prevent unloading of assets, so they can be used in events or in other places where you would need to know if an asset has loaded yet, but you don't necessarily mind if the asset gets unloaded. When creating assets, there are two distinct ways to do this. The first is to use the asset server. Once you have access to the asset server by including it as a system parameter, you can load a file path. It will load the corresponding file path using an asset loader determined by the extension of the path. 
and this is all done in the background. It will though immediately yield you back the handle ID, which again is the hash of the path and label, which is attached to the end of a path after a hashtag. I will cover the asset server in more detail in a future video since it does have more nuances to it. And it also includes things like the asset loaders. Your other option is just to directly create the asset and insert it into the assets resource. Once you have access to the resource, which is the assets with the associated generic type of your asset that you were trying to create, you can use either the add to get a randomly generated handle or set method and provide a handle ID. These will both yield a strong handle. Handle IDs can be created from any integer or from strings. If they're created from a string, they will be treated as asset path IDs. Once an asset is loaded, you can use a reference to the respective resource and call its get method and provide the handle to the desired asset. This may require casting the handle to the correct type if it is not already in the correct type or is an untyped handle. Untyped handles tend to be returned by the asset server when you're loading folders rather than individual files since each file could have a different file extension. So it will return immediately untyped and it is up to you to later determine the type. When using a handle like this into the assets, you will be returned an option containing the asset or none if the asset is not yet loaded or has not been initialized to load yet. This can be checked using the asset server. Bevy includes a whole bunch of assets in its default plugin, such as meshes, images, and sounds, with their corresponding loaders already added into the asset server. But if you need to create your own asset type, there are a few steps you need to take. The first is to derive the UID for the struct that you want to be your asset. This allows it to be used in any place where the generic asset is required, since Bevy will automatically derive that trait on any type that derives type UUID. Next, you need to initialize your asset on your application using the add asset method. This will insert the required resources, systems, and events to allow your asset to be managed by Bevy. Finally, you can add any loaders to, for your asset to the world. This is done with either the add loader if you need to create loader using code or init asset loader if the asset loader has a default or from world implementation. How to actually implement an asset loader will be covered in that said future video. Once you have a grasp on assets and are ready to start using custom assets in your game, you might want to implement your own change detection or other similar function that requires you to know when changes have happened to your assets. This can be done using asset events. Asset events are fired any time an asset is created, modified, or removed. All the systems and resources needed to manage a specific asset events are created and added when you initialize the asset into the world. So you do not need to worry about adding any of these things. These events will fire when the corresponding action is taken. These events contain a weak handle to the asset that the event relates to. So it will not prevent assets from unloading when unconsumed events are waiting. It also means it is appropriate to send events when removing known assets that will be unloaded when the event is consumed. The only time it is not entirely obvious which event will be fired is with the set method, since this will send a create event if the asset does not exist, but a modified event if it does. This is all determined under the hood, so you will not know whether it will be sending a create or modified event unless you were aware that the asset already existed when initializing the set method. The modified event is also sent whenever you call the get mute method on the associated resource. This is regardless of if the underlying asset is ever modified. That's everything you need to know about assets for now. Please like, comment, and subscribe so you don't miss the future video on the asset server and asset loaders since they are a critical part to making any large scale game.